All right, let's take a look at this um, text from the New Testament, the Apostle Paul's writing here. I'll describe more of the situation he may have been writing to in just a minute. It's kind of an odd passage in a way when you think about the place where it comes to us in the New Testament. It makes sense when we get a little more of the situation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. For you know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden for any of you. We did this not because we did, did, do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. All right, let's try to break this apart a little bit and pick up our theme for today. Working hard or hardly work in God and work ethic. First, God expects us to work. He expects us to work. Years ago, I made a trip to China with a basketball team, 1982, and it was China. It was just starting to open up to the Western world at that time, and we went in and, and learned all this stuff about China, and it's changed dramatically in the last 30 years or so. But uh, I remember walking through um, one of the major cities. It might have been uh, Beijing, might have been Shanghai, I can't remember which. And as we were walking through as a, as a team um, touring the city, I noticed as we crossed so a couple of street crossings, there were really old men or women standing at every corner of, of, that we crossed. And they were standing there just talking out loud, like kind of facing us as we walked across the street, just talking in Chinese, just talking. I didn't understand what they were saying, obviously, but they're talking almost like they're giving instructions, but they're really old people. And so finally, I asked the interpreter, what, what, what are those old, older men and women doing? He said, oh, well, they're, they're re reminding people uh, not to litter, not to spit on the street, stuff like that. That's their job. And then he kind of bragged. He said, everybody works in China, he said. I was kind of impressed by that. And since then, I've learned that the employment system in China really isn't all that rosy, especially for people over 50. But at the time, it was kind of impressive that everyone had a job. They bragged about zero unemployment back in those days. It's, it's not true today. But I was kind of impressed. In this text in Thessalonians, Paul is reminding the early Christians that everyone has a job, or more important, appropriately, everyone has a work to do. God expects us to work. And more than that, God commands us to work. We've been talking about that all team season from Adam in the Garden of Eden, way back in the book of Genesis, all the way through Scripture. God expects us, commands us to work. Seems like a no-brainer. So why do we need to say it again? Why did Paul need to say it again in this situation? And for we need to say it again because our experience of work, as we've been talking about, has been has been warped, has been distorted. And in the case of the first century Thessalonians, and by the way, that city, Thessalonica or Thessaloniki, however you say it, was in ancient Greece, uh, kind of not far from Turkey, and it would have all fallen under the, uh, the ancient Roman Empire, sort of the tail end of the ancient Roman Empire in the first century. But people in that culture tended to think of work as being for the lower class. We talked about that earlier this year. Work tended to be for what were called slaves. And if you were high enough in society, you just had people doing that stuff for you, and you lived a life of relative ease and leisure. And many of the early Christians in the first century were of the working class or of the slave class, and it's quite possible that many of them aspired to escape that class of society and to live lives more of leisure. Some of them may have also believed that through the teachings of the early apostles and some misunderstandings that maybe Jesus, the one who had um, risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, was coming back very soon so that they really didn't need to work at all. Not in this world anyway. They were looking forward to the next world to come. Not unlike a group of people back in the mid-1800s called the Millerites in the northeastern United States. William Miller was a preacher who began to predict the return of Christ. One of those guys. You know, we see them every uh, decade or so. Somebody starts to predict the world's end and when it's all going to come down and when Jesus is coming back and so forth. Well, this guy predicted the day to be October 22nd, 1844. And a lot of people began to follow his teachings. Some of his followers were so convinced that he was right that there were farmers in, the northern, in, in upstate New York, they, began, they didn't harvest their crops that fall. They just waited for the end to come. They stopped working. And when that day came and went, it later came to be known as the Great Disappointment. 
And eventually, uh, William Miller sort of fell out of favor, died not long after that, but still some people uh, still followed his teaching for some time. Now, for us, I think we're a little more like the ancient Roman uh, Empire folks than we are the Millerites. That is, we have a tendency to see work as something that we endure to get to the weekend, or we endure to get to where we don't have to do it anymore. You know, the commercial that came out months ago, Hump Day, you know, just get through Wednesday, uh, TGIF. Let's just get to Friday afternoon. We sort of endure work to get to the weekend. We sort of endure work to get to vacations, to get to retirement, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. We dream of a life of more leisure. We have kind of this love-hate relationship with work. And, be- and that's uh, because the Bible says our work has been cursed, in a sense, by sin. It's no longer the source of our fellowship and enjoyment with God. It's something else, and we struggle with that. And we've talked about it all year. Now, notice this warning in the text. Very curious. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is pretty serious. When you attach Jesus' name to a command or a warning, pretty serious. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Interesting. What does he mean? By idle. What's so dangerous about those who are idle? The word idle there literally means those who are idly walking. And if you do a little word study on this word in, 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 Le- in the Greek language, it means undisciplined or unruly, disorderly, kind of a directionless life. And the image comes to mind as I read through the description of the word is, um, you know, a 25-year-old still living in his parents' basement playing video games. You know, sort of that failure to launch syndrome comes to mind. Idle, a directionless, unruly, undisciplined. Uh, Paul may have had several real-life possibilities in mind here. Uh, like some we've already mentioned. Some believe Jesus was coming back, and if he's coming back, it's all good. I don't have to worry about anything. I'm not going to work. Some believe that just God would provide for them, so they didn't feel the need to work. Others were just lazy and unwilling to work. Look also as Paul continues. For you know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor do we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a a model for you to follow. We can talk about two forms of work here. First, and most obviously, work for Hey, this is what we do to earn a living. We've said all year long, all honest work honors God. There's no distinction in Scripture between sacred work and secular work, between people who do what I do and people who do what you do. There's no distinction in Scripture. All honest work honors God. Paul himself was a tent maker. That is, he had a skill, a craft. He made tents out of leather or canvas or whatever and sold them. That's how he earned and paid his way through. He was also a pastor, missionary, apostle. He had a spiritual ministry, but he worked for his living as well. Worked for pay. But there's another kind of work we need to observe, we need to uh, identify here, and that is work as service. This is work that we do for which we do not receive compensation, at least not in money. Uh, We could cite all kinds of examples here. We could talk about master's hands. We talk about every now and then. The people, from guys from our church go out and serve and do handy jobs for senior citizens and shut-ins and widows and so forth. Mexico trip, guys go build houses for people in Mexico. Uh, mentoring boys in a prison, teaching children in Sunday school, coaching youth teams out in the community. There's all kinds of work we can do that's just service. We don't receive financial compensation, yet it is work because it's the opposite of being idle. Work is that which protects us from an idle, undisciplined, disorderly life. And we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. God expects us to work. Secondly, God provides through our work. This is also kind of a review today. We've said that before. Over the years, I've uh, seen more than a few situations in my work that have reminded me of what Paul's talking about here. Sometimes it's the family who comes to talk to me because they have a 25-year-old living in the basement playing video games, and they, they're trying to figure out how to get that, that adult, child, late adolescent motivated in their lives. But other times, it's much different. It's a 40- or 50-year-old man uh, with a family. And the general pattern is this. For some reason, usually um, uh, a time of unemployment or 
severe underemployment, uh, families struggling to make ends meet, and they come to the church for help. And now we have a very active ministry called the Benevolent Ministry and our CIA ministries. We help dozens and dozens of individuals and families all throughout the year, inside and outside the church. And when we get involved with helping a family, we usually dig in a little bit. Our staff digs in to find out what the core roots of the issues are to try to not just throw money at a problem, but begin to figure out the real issues. And um, what begins to appear is um, not just a, little, a family being down on their luck, husband losing a job, debts piling up quickly, but also can't seem to find a new job, and it's just a difficult place to be. And these unhealthy patterns begin to show up. For example, we've seen a number of times uh, when we dig into these situations where the husband will, for whatever reason, begin to sort of drag his feet when time comes to actually apply for or interview for a new job. Even when those contacts are provided for him, there'll be excuses. Well, I can't do this, or well, I, can't, I couldn't make that appointment, or well, got this going on. And we, it begins to send up some red flags. A second area is the wife doesn't seem to be willing to make any sacrifices in lifestyle to reduce a monthly budget. Unwilling to sell a car, for example, unwilling to downsize their home, insist on continuing to send their kids to private schools. We just, we just see this sort of syndrome emerge. We've seen it several times. In one very extreme case, we actually discovered that while we as a church were offering counsel and assistance financially to a family, they were going and soliciting help on the side from other people inside the church, even receiving personal gifts and personal loans. And the wife would stand up and give these emotional pleas and ask people to pray that God would provide for them, okay? And people did step up and give them resources, but we began to suspect something was wrong, and it was. Something that we might call pathological worth, a work avoidance, or what Paul calls idleness. And when we began to confront that issue with this particular family, they were gone, and we never saw them again. Because they, did, they didn't want to be confronted on that particular issue. They wanted God to provide without them doing the work themselves. Okay? The Bible teaches us here that God's provision is work. God's provision for us is work. Work is how God provides our daily needs. Work is how God provides for our families. Work is how God provides for, for those who cannot work through our generosity. But notice, big difference between cannot work and will not work. Paul writes, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Now, we need to be very careful here. Paul did not write this so we could judge other people and their motives. He wrote it so we can examine ourselves and our motives. So, big question. What if you want to work and are willing to work but can't find work? Some of you may be in that situation right now. We see it every year at team. The economy is difficult. Life's tough sometimes. Does that mean you're guilty of being idle? Are you what Paul's talking about? Not necessarily. First, you need to understand that in that situation, your work is to find work. And those who've been through that will tell you that sometimes that's the hardest work of all. The most challenging work of all is the work of finding work. It's frustrating. It's filled with failure. It can be humiliating to try and try and try and fail and fail and fail and get rejected, rejected, rejected. It's difficult. But your work to find work honors God. Okay? Your work to find work honors God, so keep at it. Secondly, what if you can't find work that matches your experience or your expectations? There are two kinds of attitudes here, and I've seen them both many, many times. One is, I'm looking for work. I can't find what I really need. I can't find what I want. I can't find what, what I think I'm worth. And so I refuse to settle for anything less, and I keep aiming for that up here. And I just keep, keep, keep trying, all right? I keep trying, or maybe I give up. I won't take less than the ideal. On the other hand, I find guys who t will do whatever it takes and take whatever it takes to be able to at least provide for their families. You see the two, two different poles? One says, nope, I deserve that. I'm not settling for anything less, and I'll, I'm willing to be out of work until I find that. Sometimes a year, two years, three years, and family suffers. The other guy says, I'll do whatever it takes, and I'll work at some job while I keep working for the better job down here. Sometimes you need to find another kind of work. Thirdly, if you can't find any kind of work for pay, any kind of work for money, any kind of work for which you can be compensated for, then what? Do another kind of work. Serve somewhere. We're going to talk more about this in a couple of weeks when we talk about retirement. But the idea is to avoid idleness. Whatever we have to do to avoid idleness, 
God would have us do. Because thirdly, we need to see today that laziness in Scripture is a form of sin. Laziness is a form of sin. I listen to a, um, a radio talk show when I drive around during the day, a sports talk show. I, I probably listen to it too much, but it's just entertaining. Um, and they do a thing sometimes on Fridays and they, they had a call-in show and they asked guys to call in with their tales of laziness. Just guys call in and confessing the laziest thing they'd ever done or been a part of. And, I, and it's just very funny to hear what guys do because we're all capable of great tales of laziness. And it reminded me of one of my own stories. So as I was, sitting, as I was listening, I was actually at home, in my, at home in my home office listening on my computer and I was working on some stuff. So I decided, I remembered this story and I emailed it into him, my own tale of laziness. And it actually got on the air. The guy read it on the air. My tale of laziness happened when I was back in graduate school. I was like 25 years old, wasn't married yet, um, living in a small apartment while I was going to school, you know, working during the day, going to school at night, was rarely around my apartment, and I, I um, lived as a single guy. I, I would make myself the cheapest meals I could, so I would, I would grill up hamburgers in a, in a, in a uh, frying pan, basically, uh, in my apartment. But I was too lazy to clean out the, the grease out of the... I used to, would just leave it there because that's all I used it for is to cook, cook hamburgers. So I would just pile up the hamburger grease in this, in this uh, pan. And then uh, one day I decided that I wanted, to make, I, I wanted to make popcorn. And so I thought, I'm not going to clean out that pan. Oh, there's already grease in there. So I just heated up the hamburger grease and made, the, and, you know, we made popcorn the old-fashioned way. Before you had microwave popcorn, you cooked it in grease and oil. And so I just threw the popcorn in there, and it worked. It popped it right up fine. It, it just tasted vaguely like hamburger. <laughs> and I told him I invented accidentally hamburger-flavored popcorn. And I used to give it to people when they came to my apartment, you know, dates and stuff, and they all liked it. They're like, this is cool popcorn. What is this popcorn? So I, I should be the next Orville Redenbacher, but... Tales of laziness. Um, laziness traditionally is called sloth. The, uh, sloth is one of the seven deadly sins in Christian tradition. Sloth is defined as spiritual or emotional apathy that is neglecting what God has spoken, neglecting or refusing or carelessness in the performance of one's obligations, especially spiritual, moral, moral or legal ob obligations. Sloth is just a form of laziness. And there, I think there are several forms of it that we look, can look at. First, procrastination. Procrastination looks a lot like laziness, but I think it's, many times it's a form of fear. You know, I've said before, I organize my work life around a list. I make a list every week, and many of you guys make lists. I actually write them down. You may keep it in your head. You may keep it on your electronic device or whatever. Uh, but I keep this list of things to do. And what I notice, after a week or two, if the same things keep showing up on that list that I've not yet done... If I really look at them, there's a reason why I haven't done those things yet, why I've procrastinated on those couple of items, and usually it has to do with something I find distasteful or some, for some reason, something I don't do very well, something I might be a little bit anxious about, or something I'm fearful of, something I'm uncomfortable with. I put them off, and so that's a form of sloth. It's a form of laziness. It's procrastination. Sometimes procrastination is out of fear of failure, fear of looking foolish, uh, I think sometimes in the men I've known who struggled in finding work when they go through a season without work, it's because they eventually find the fear of failure, or the pain of failure, so great that they just can't continue, and they stop, and they kind of shut down. It's a form of sloth or idleness. Whatever its root causes, why would sloth be called a sin? Aren't there a lot worse things out there than just being slothful or lazy or procrastinating? Well, yeah, there are. But sloth contradicts God's expectations for us. Laziness negates God's desire to provide for us, which is why Paul warns against it. Last thought. Sloth or idleness can impact more areas of our lives than just our work. That's what Paul's talking about here, work. Providing for yourself. Carrying your own weight so you can provide for others. But it also can apply to other areas of our life. If idleness is, that, is to be undisciplined or disordered or unruly, it's possible to be highly motivated in one area of your life, like work, for example. My guess is most of us in this room would identify ourselves as being motivated when it comes to our work, our profession. But it's possible to be slothful in another area of our lives. For example, what about our physical lives? taking care of our bodies that the Bible says is the temple of the Holy Spirit. How you eat, how you sleep, how you rest, how you exercise. What about being idle in our relational lives? That is, failing to pay attention to the key relationships of our lives and invest energy into them. What about our economic life, being undisciplined with our resources? 
What about in our spiritual lives? One of the reasons I love team is that you can't be idle and be part of team. You have to be disciplined enough to get up and get here at 6 a.m. on a Friday morning, and it's not easy. It takes effort to get here. We're fighting against the tendency towards spiritual idleness. One of the good books written a number of years ago was called Ordering Your Private World. Spiritual disciplines of our life are, like, are about ordering our private world. The disciplines of prayer, worship, personal, devotional, Bible reading. What they do for us is they order our internal world, our spiritual, emotional world. Idleness, laziness is about more than our work lives. It shows up, and wherever it shows up in our lives, idleness, Paul says, is the enemy. Now, let's take a, a pause there, and I want to guide you to some questions to look at. And these are going to be very small, so when you put them on the board, you probably can't even read them. But I'm going to read them through, and uh, then if you're a leader, maybe make a mental note of how to ask these questions, how to maybe to follow up. First question is, is asking you to, uh, where would you rate yourself on the work ethic scale? Here I'm thinking about primarily your work life. Zero would be couch potato lazy all the way on one end. You know, if you had your way, you'd just lay on the couch. Very few of us are there, but you might be. Uh, in the middle would be reasonable work ethic, get the job done. Ten would be ten, uh, t that, you move, that you personally tend toward workaholism, that you maybe work too much. Okay, so you got this big continuum. Where would you locate yourself with regard to your work life on that? Give yourself a number, three, seven, eight, something like that. But then, I don't have this question written down, but then see if you can apply that to other major areas of your life. Apply the same work ethic to, let's say, your relational life. Are you lazy relationally or do you invest yourself? How about to your spiritual life? Lazy, invested. How about in your physical life? Lazy, invested. Just, just look across your life and see if you can find any areas where you come out closer to zero on, on the work ethic scale. Secondly, where did your personal work ethic come from? How did it develop in you? Did it come from your dad? Did it come from your mom? Did it come from others' experiences in life? Where did your work ethic, ethic come from or your lack of it? Thirdly, when you find yourself procrastinating, most of us do somewhere in our lives. Getting your taxes in, cleaning out the garage, getting at that honeydew list. When you find yourself procrastinating, what is the root of your procrastination? Is it fear? Is it uh, anger? Is it resentment? Why do you put off what you put off? Uh, lastly, if you get here, this is a lot of questions. Fourth, have you ever worked with someone who was indeed truly lazy? And how did you find ways to motivate that person? That might just be a fun talk if you've ever had to manage people before. So get some coffee, have a discussion, wrap you up right before 7 o'clock as usual.